This is the Big Dipper, or more accurately, it was the Big Dipper. This roller coaster was first constructed at Luna Park Sydney in the 1990s, but now it's been relocated to Dreamworld where it is operated for the past 23 years. Today we're going to talk about how it stacks up against the current Big Dipper, and is it a good ride for Dreamworld? Let's talk about Dreamworld's custom arrow looping coaster, today known as the Gold Coaster. Gold Coaster was originally opened in 1995 at Luna Park, Sydney, part of a massive revival of the park. Designed by Arrow Dynamics and constructed in Melbourne and Newcastle, the project cost 8 million Australian dollars, opening as Australia's tallest roller coaster at the time. Luna Park had operated inconsistently through the 1980s, and this was to be its new signature attraction to revive interest in the park, the Big Dipper. Luna Park initially closed its doors in 1979 after almost 45 years of operation after seven guests were tragically killed in a fire in the park's ghost train. Following this fire, many of the park's original rides were sadly sold off and scrapped, with only the desperate efforts of a volunteer organisation known as the Friends of Luna Park resulting in some of the more historic pieces of the park's heritage being protected. The park would reopen in 1982, however neglectful management practices would result in this iteration of the park again closing in 1988. In the early 1990s, plans began for yet another revival, this time with a lot more ambition. Works continued throughout 1994 to rebuild the park, which had sat in an abandoned state for much of the past six years, before it finally reopened in 1995. However, due to noise complaints from neighbouring residents, the park was promptly forced to close down again in 1996, and the Big Dipper's operating hours were harshly restricted. The coaster, standing over 40 metres tall, received complaints due to its loud mechanical noise pollution, as well as the screams of riders, which were in close proximity to residential apartments in the neighbouring suburb of Milsons Point. As a result, the park opted to sell and relocate the coaster, as any hopes of Luna Park continuing to operate in the future would be reliant on their ride lineup being far less obstructive to the skyline and far less disruptive in terms of noise. Luckily, it was purchased by Gold Coast theme park Dreamworld and reopened as the Cyclone at the Queensland Park in 2001. Since then, the ride has become one of the major thrill coasters at the park, being rethemed twice, first to Hot Wheels Sidewinder as part of a partnership with Hot Wheels and Mattel, which also saw the coaster receive new trains from Vacoma, and then back to the generic theme of the Gold Coaster, a play on the coaster's Queensland location. The ride is located in the Ocean Parade section of the park, and due to its particularly unique original footprint at Luna Park, Sydney, it has a very strange and unusual station building. The station is elevated particularly high off the ground, with the coaster weaving around water slide towers in the neighbouring white water world. The entrance to the ride features a particularly strange circular building, part of the original cyclone theming, as well as being Dreamworld's unusual solution to the coaster's elevated station, which was originally designed to be atop one of the roofs on Luna Park's Midway. The ride's current theming scheme features testaments to the Gold Coast's regional culture, with surfboards, thongs, and a pastel colour palette. The theming is fairly minimal, although I definitely like the new colour scheme. It gives the coaster a more unique feel, and the teal blue is a great track colour. The ride's operations seem fine, considering that it is a relatively long coaster with only one train. The major perk that you'll find with this ride is that it rarely draws a line at all, meaning you'll often have a station wait, or even just be able to walk onto the ride. It's probably one of the few rides on the Gold Coast that I never recall having to wait for. For that reason, operators will sometimes wait to fill a train up a little bit before dispatching, but otherwise, it operates just fine considering it only has one train. But operations aside, let's talk about the ride itself. The coaster is a large-scale arrow looper. It stands 40 metres tall, or 131 feet, with 2,953 feet of track. It hits a top speed of 85 kilometres an hour, featuring two inversions. While the coaster was designed and manufactured by Aerodynamics, it is actually an Australian product, with the parts being built in Melbourne and Newcastle. The ride starts with a 180 degree turn to the left out of the station into the 40 meter lift hill. Once you ascend the lift, you turn 180 degrees back to the left before dropping down the first drop. Particularly in the back, this drop has a nice yanking moment of airtime that makes the drop feel a little bit out of control. It's not rough, but it has that classic arrow jerkiness, which I absolutely love about it. The train rises up into a large bank turn over the station building, which has a healthy amount of jank to it. It then heads down into another large bank turn underneath the ride support structure. 
This one is the only moment of the ride that I'll criticize. The exit on this turn is poorly profiled and extremely janky. There are a couple of sudden jerks as the train levels back out, which used to be certified headbanger moments back when the train had hard over the shoulder restraints instead of vest restraints. After this, the ride emphasizes its raw speed with a quick S-bend, followed by a sharply banked turn that wraps around a water slide tower in neighboring White Water World. This is really where the ride kicks up a notch. It is still carrying so much speed and it hurdles through this bend with some powerful positives. This bend leads into the first inversion, a reverse sidewinder. It's powerful, but definitely the weaker of the two inversions because what comes next is unbelievably powerful. The second inversion is a vertical loop, which slams you with positive g-force. In the front, it hits you like a car crash, while in the back, you're whipped through the loop with incredible force. I love this inversion, it's one of my favourites in Australia. From here, you rise into a piece of straight track before turning 180 degrees to the right and into the final brakes. Gold Coaster's layout is particularly weird, but that actually can be its strength. Some of the moments are just so unique, and I don't think they can quite be replicated. But would I say it's a good arrow looper? Is it better than the current Big Dipper? And do I think it's the right fit for Dreamworld? Let's discuss it in a bit more detail. But before we do, did you know that visiting theme parks to research and make these videos costs money? Shocker, right? That's why I have a Buy Me A Coffee page. If you really like this content and you'd like to support me in making more, you can scan the QR code to buy me a coffee, or you can become a channel member for just $5 a month, which gets you weekly bonus content, merch giveaways, a dedicated Discord channel with video previews, and much, much more. Scan the QR code or click the link in the description, but no pressure, my channel content will always be free, but any support is greatly appreciated. Okay, back to the review. Gold Coaster's biggest strength and biggest weakness is the layout that it was originally designed for. At Luna Park Sydney, which is a notably compact park, the ride was designed to make the most out of the tops of the park's existing midway buildings, a narrow alleyway of land behind the park's funhouse, and a newly purchased small plot of land just next to the funhouse. The coaster would occupy a very significant portion of the entire park's land, and would require a particularly unique layout in order to successfully navigate the area. One of the results of this is that, Unlike most arrow loopers, the inversions come very late in the ride. In fact, they're pretty much the last two elements. However, I don't think this has any significant impact on the way they ride. Both are still very forceful, and the ride still carries a lot of speed at this stage of the ride. And that's my major praise for the way this layout was designed. Obviously, Arrow realized that they didn't have much area to work with, and that larger elements that drew away too much speed early in the layout was just not a feasible option. This results in the ride being extremely well paced, and it's particularly noticeable in that second half when you hurdle through that bank turn and the two inversions. The bank turn may actually be my favorite element. There's head choppers with the slide tower structure, and it's so fast and full of positives. Brilliant. However, I must say that I find the first half of the layout is quite weak, and I think it's a product of the lack of creativity and ingenuity that Arrow showed later in their existence. For those who don't know, this ride was built around seven years before Arrow ultimately went bankrupt and then went completely defunct. One of the reasons for the widespread success of the Arrow looping coaster was that Arrow developed precise measurements for each of their classic elements, such as their vertical loops and other inversions. Basically, whenever they designed a new layout, they would just insert these cookie cutter elements, which would save a lot on design and fabrication costs, since pretty much all of Arrow's manufacturing was done manually. This resulted in them eventually becoming outshone and obsolete compared to the coasters of manufacturers like B&M, who began to use computer design guided processes to allow their elements to be designed and customized and still retain their smoothness. This layout, if designed by B&M, probably would have used the space a lot more creatively. Now the first half of Gold Coaster is also a perfect example of why Arrow's design method was smart for the 1970s, but not so smart in the 1990s. Firstly, it is uncreative. It just doesn't do much. Two big bank turns with not a whole lot of force, and it does take up an awful lot of space for two very uninspiring elements. Secondly, it is janky. Especially that exit to the second bank turn is a really horrid moment. The transition out of the turn is just poorly designed, and it comes down to the fact that Arrow were measuring the radius and curve of their turns essentially by hand. And unfortunately, when the ride hasn't offered that much in terms of fun and force by this point, it's really unforgivable and leaves a bitter taste in the mouth. 
However, those complaints are ultimately just a product of this generation of arrow coasters, and there are many others that are worse. I think particularly since getting vest restraints to reduce the pain of headbanging, Gold Coaster has massively improved, and I still thoroughly enjoy this coaster. I'd say it's definitely not the best arrow looper in the world, but it is a unique and fun one, and one that will pleasantly surprise you. As for the comparison to the current Big Dipper, what's interesting to me is that I'd say Luna Park have kind of broken even in terms of coaster quality here. The similarities are really striking. You've got two coasters with weird layouts that have a couple of great moments and a couple of very significant flaws, including roughness and a few dead moments. If I had to choose one, I'd probably go with the new Big Dipper, but not by much. They're on very similar standing to me, and I do like them both. But is Gold Coaster the right fit for Dreamworld? The obvious answer is no, simply because it was never designed for Dreamworld. But I must say, for a ride that they picked up on the cheap that was custom designed for a completely different park, they've really made it work. Building Whitewater World around the ride's second half really makes this coaster feel like it belongs in its footprint, and while it's still got a weird layout, it kinda works. So maybe it wasn't right for them, but they made it work anyway. I also must say, it's been a real loyal soldier for the park during one of its most difficult eras. Gold Coaster is the only thrill coaster to have survived into the post-Thunder River era, and it remains a relatively popular ride, and definitely the park's number two coaster, even after Steel Taipan was constructed. It definitely has done a really good job for the park, and it's just a ride you have to respect for that. However, my final thought is that I suspect the ride is coming to the end of its service life. It tends to go up and down throughout the day, it's had a few extended closures in the past five years, and it's now been almost 10 years since the new Vacoma trains were installed. They've got their money's worth out of those. I think they'll give it a little while longer just to make the most out of the relatively new name and color scheme, but at the end of the day, this is a very large parcel of land that this coaster was never designed for. There's a lot the park could do with it, and I suspect it will be one of the next things Dreamworld removes in order to make room for something else. You know what I think? A Vacoma Looper. A Bermuda Blitz or a Wildcat could go really nicely here. It would fill that slot of the inversion focus coaster much more effectively than Gold Coaster, and actually, I would argue it would probably become the park's new number one with Steel Taipan as its number two. That's just my two cents on the issue. But my final thoughts on Gold Coaster. This is a good ride. It's forceful, it's fun, it's a little janky, but it's got some great moments. I think Dreamworld can be really happy with the return they got on this investment, and while I suspect the end is near, it's a coaster that I'll definitely look back on fondly. Thank you for watching my full review of Dreamworld's Gold Coaster. Please consider liking and subscribing, and I'll see you next time.